Uh, I'm going to give a very personal introduction of literally half a minute to say that uh, Maisie, when I was growing up, uh, I lived in Hens and Golders Green and I went to Monks. And when Monks moved over to the shore they're in now, they moved out and I believe that your community took over the shore. And you're, you had a daughter and you had a niece, um, Esther and Debbie, and they were a year above me. And I always knew that you came from very exotic beginnings and um, London must have been a very interesting thing to have to, um, to, to really adapt to. So I'm actually really personally excited to, to hear um, the story of the Shanghai Express. So welcome, Maisie. Thank you very, very much. Uh, good morning. It'll give me great pleasure to flout the COVID restrictions, the travel restrictions, and take you on a journey of thousands of miles that spans two centuries to find out about Jews who left Baghdad and settled in Shanghai in the mid-19th century. Welcome aboard the Shanghai Express. Please sit comfortably and fasten your seat belts because we'll be traveling at tremendous speed. There's no need to wear masks. Okay, let's begin. Let me just see it. Yeah. Let's begin in here in Baghdad. Baghdadi Jews were proud of their rich Babylonian heritage. They traced their roots as far back as 598 BCE when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, conquered the kingdom of Judah and transported Jews from Jerusalem to Babylon. Their rabbis were the supreme religious authorities within world Jewry. And this is Hakam Yosef Haim, one of Bag Baghdad's most illustrious rabbis. These photos give you a glimpse of the background of the community. Notice their dress was influenced by the fashions of the Ottoman Empire. Well, I just point out what is what is he holding in his hand? Do you know? Anyone knows? The beads, the prayer beads, worry beads, worry beads. Uh, they were used certainly for, I'll tell you, I found out how they were used and why. They were used to decide whether uh, a business proposition was going to be viable. So uh, they would count start on an odd bead. And if they ended on an even one, they went ahead with the deal. And I, I know it really does work because I, I was with uh, uh, Mr. Dungur, you've seen a picture of his family, and he's really wealthy. So it works. Now, here we see a merchant. Um, they're not allowed to, to carry swords. They were, they were dimmy second class citizens, but here for the picture, he is carrying swords, a sword. Now, the Sassoon family were respected leaders of a flourishing Jewish community, but all this changed under the oppressive rule of Dawood Pasha in the, in the 1820s. He persecuted his Jewish subjects and, and, and actually imprisoned uh, uh, Sheikh Sassoon's son, David. Sassoon fled from Baghdad and settled in Busha, a trading post of the British East India Company. And it's here on the Persian Gulf, let me just see. I think, Hava, you were the one that put this red in for me. Thank you. When the East India Company's trading monopoly was abolished, opening India's doors to private enterprise, the Sassoons decided to, to reside in India. In 1833, David Sassoon settled in Bombay, which was a British possession. There was political security and religious freedom. Now this is David the founder of a vast commercial enterprise dealing in an unlimited range of merchandise. His garments and headdress add to his impressive appearance and he never gave up wearing them. Perhaps his greatest asset was his family of 14 children, including eight sons from two marriages. They became his valuable agents. 
And this is Farah Sassoon, his second wife, who was only 11 years old at the time of their marriage. There was a difference of 35 years between the eldest and youngest child. The Sassoon firm especially employed Jews from Baghdad as clerks. Judeo Arabic was the media of communication. This is Hebrew written in Arab, Arabic script. And for convenience, the term Baghdadi encompasses Jews from Syria and other parts of the Ottoman Empire, Aden and Yemen, all of whom are Arabic speaking, and also Jews from Persia and Afghanistan who were not. The Sassoon family laid the foundations to preserve the religious traditions and Baghdadi culture, their identity. And uh, David's generosity to the citizens of Bombay is impressive. And after his death, they contributed towards a huge statue of him. And uh, you can see it towering over everyone. Actually, it's not that one, it's this one. Oh, it, it towers over everyone in the Sassoon Library in Bombay. In Bombay, Baghdadis encountered the Bene Israel and Cochin Jews. Now, unlike their religious uh, co religionists, I mean, uh, they, unlike their co religionists, the Baghdadis seem to be unaffected by the culture and creed of their Indian neighbors. They had misgivings about the purity of descent and the religious observance of Bene Israel and discourage marriage with them. Acculturation to the British and racial barriers promoted colonialism. That's what colonialism promoted, led the Baghdadis to distance themselves from the Bene Israel as they felt association with them might lower their own status. The Baghdadis were pragmatists and wished to identify with their British neighbors, uh, not the British, they were actually their British rulers, um, in the hope of achieving political security and social privilege. After all, they had arrived in India when Britain was politically dominant and all that was Western seemed worthy of emulation. Here's David Sassoon with his three of his sons um, at a conference in Via in Vienna. Yes, I uh, I was asked if he was the butler. Now this, in fact, is um, this Solomon Sassoon, one of one of the few branches of the family that maintain their religious traditions, and that's him with his wife Flora. And she my, was regal, absolutely regal. She settled in Bruton Street and was renowned for extensive knowledge of the Torah. It really had lived like royalty. Well, at long last, we have arrived in Shanghai. The Treaty of Nanking, which brought together, which brought to an end the open, infamous opium wars of 1842 opened Shanghai, another treaty port to trade. 10 square miles of land outside Shanghai was set, set aside for foreign residents. And these evolved into the international settlement, um, which combined the British and American settlements, the French concession and the Chinese city. They were separate administrative units, each with their own government laws and officials. David Sassoon sent his second son, Elias, to, to establish a branch of the firm in Shanghai when he was not quite 25 years old in 1845. And uh, Elias traded in general merchandise and commodity. He purchased land at incredibly low prices. And this was a wise move as later it was to spiral astronomically. Baghdadi Jewish merchants left their family for lengthy periods to take advantage of the lucrative Chinese, Chinese trade. Undeterred by the orders of 70 days in wretched old tramp steamers. The journeys were a catalog of disasters, including being grounded for days, 
the cargo being thrown overboard, sitting through the night with guns at the ready in case of pirates. In, 18, in the 1870s, Shanghai was overcrowded with frequent cholera and typhoid outbreaks, an exceptionally high death rate. Their religious traditions, kingship, endogamy, my daddy's only in married, but my daddy's, similar commercial interest and distinctive cuisine bonded them together. And in this way, they forged an identity with other Baghdadi Jews who had settled in trading outposts as far flung as, I think well, that's not marked up there, it's in the next one. Wait a minute, there we go. This is where we see the trading outposts. I've put them in red, so it makes it think. And, and these were in Bombay, Calcutta, Pune, Cochin, Singapore, Rangoon, Hong Kong, Java, Kobe, Nagasaki, and Yokohama. So they really did spread out. And there was constant toing and froing between them to give you an idea how close the interaction really was. The Mohel's name was China Clipper because he was called upon so frequently to perform circumcisions in Shanghai. Uh, and here I have a picture of them. That's him with his wife, Hakam Eliyahu, and his wife, Leah. And this is the Jacob family. After serving for, as apprentices in the Tsun firm, Baghdadi Jews generally branched out on their own independently and dealt in tea, silk, cotton, and wait for it, opium. Incredibly, in 1858 to 1914, it was legal. One could buy opium at auctions conducted by the British government. Large revenues from taxes made it very profitable for the British to support the trade. Clearly, economic values outweighed moral principles. Now, former Shanghai Baghdadis are still sensitive about their ancestors' involvement in the trade. And they point out that the money was largely plowed back into China's economy, and it really was. Indeed, opium merchants were prominent members of the foreign community and several received awards from the Chinese government for their philanthropy. Well, however, this argument cut little ice when at a conference in Vienna, I was heckled by a Chinese gentleman who was ballistic with rage at the opium war's ruthless exploitation of his country. And he was totally justified. Today, it beggars belief that statesmen like Palmerston launched these wars because of what they considered was intolerable restrictions on freedom to trade. But I think they should be judged according to the standards of justice applicable at the, at the time of the slave trade, colonization, etc. Thank goodness we don't have time to go into that for us. As we all know, sadly oppression and subjugation are old themes in world history. Well, on a lighter note, Baghdadis were just one of numerous minority groups in China. Common commercial in interest, the fact that the English, they all communicated in English, was crucial to identifying with the British who had powers in the international settlement. Although foreign devils were never welcomed by the populace, this was made abundantly clear in the Boxer Uprising of 1900, and even more so, awakening, the awakening of intense Chinese patriotism in 1920s. Now, life in the treaty port, port had all the trappings of colonialism. Great efforts to preserve, uh, to preserve a white superiority were made and a rigid set of rules demarcated social boundaries. Now, in this context, I'd like to draw your attention to the heroic efforts of the Baghdadis to rescue remnants of the Kaifeng Jewish community. 
this community, which numbered about 1,500, came to China by the Silk Route in about the 12th century. Yeah, um, they became assimilated and lost to Judaism because of a lack of teachers, isolation from other Jewish entities, and not pleased, as you can see, through intermarriage. Notice that even the child has have their, found, their feet bound. It's hard to believe that these are Jewish women. In 1898, the Shanghai community received a letter informing them that a Catholic priest had purchased a Kaifeng Torah scroll. The thought of their sacred scroll in the hands of priests galvanized them into taking immediate steps to rescue the remnants of the Kaifeng Jews, now reduced to only eight families. And they wrote this impassioned letter signed by the members of the community. Actually, it's a very valuable document because it really gives you the name of all the members, or well, at least most of them, the men at the time. Now, very generously offering, they offered to collect money, to build a synagogue, and to send teachers to instruct them, to assist them to come to Shanghai, where they'd be taught a trade. Yeah, eight Kaifeng Jews came to Shanghai. They attended synagogue, and taught Hebrew and English in, Jew in the Jewish schools, and they visited Jewish homes. Now, must bear in mind that foreigners regard Chinese as socially inferior, so they really risked compromising their own social status in this class-ridden society. And as you notice, it's sharp contrast, contrast to their attitude to the Bene Israel. And I've, I've given many reasons for this in my a presentation on the Baghdadi Jews in um, helping the Kaifan Jews. Now, so we have, uh, they, they, with the passage of time, now this is what happened. These are the guys that came. With the passage of time, the order of the Bene, of the Shanghai Jews cooled and the Israel's messenger, which is a journal of the Baghdadi Jews. It observed in 1924. It practically means making converts of strange people for they are Jews no longer. They are Chinese, absorbed, assimilated, and rendered indistinguishable. The sadness of it makes one weep. And I must tell you that when I was going through these documents, I really did, I, I might have just shed a tear. Now, in contrast to Kaifeng Jews, intermarriage was uncommon among Baghdadis, given that they were strictly monogamous. And it was a quantum leap when Silas Arad Hardun intermarried. He was born in 1851, and he immigrated to Bombay when he was five years old. He had no formal education, but his exceptional business acumen enabled him to work his way up from a lowly go-down minder. And he became a manager of the Sassoon firm. And he set out on his own investing in rental properties with huge success. He lived in a pagoda roofed home with his Eurasian wife, Lisa, Elisa Rus Hardun. Her mother, was a, a Chinese seamstress, a father, a French sailor. Now their 40 acre garden, wait, their 40 acre garden housed a Buddhist monastery with a temple and with accommodation for nuns and monks and a vast retinue of servants and their relatives. Intriguingly, Hardun combined extravagance with severe austerity there was no heating in his office, and there was no rug. And uh, on, so on a cold day, he sat bundled up in his overcoat with fingerless gloves. But he was interested in, in preserving China's cultural heritage. 
there's a Chinese tradition of Quran, and he, he promoted Chinese techniques. And he regarded China as his home, and he wished to use his work for the benefit of China, of the Chinese people. For his philanthropy, he received 12 rewards. These awards, these are medals, and they were the highest the Chinese government had ever bestowed on a foreigner. And there we see some of them, and here they're proudly dis displaying it. The Chinese government invited Hardun to Peking, and they gave him an arm escort, and he got to dine with Pui, the boy emperor. This is stuff of fairy tales. Now, Hardun maintained links with the Jewish community. As we see, there's a reception for Dr. Ariel Ben Sion, who is a Zionist emissary, and he hosts um, the Jewish community for many functions. And but rumor had it that Hardun had a dream in which his father appeared to him and reprimanded him for not doing enough for his own community. So he woke up and donated this wonderful synagogue, the Bed Aron Synagogue. This, I, it's iconic really, but it was at the time. It cost about, it cost 300,000 pounds which is by conservative group, a conservative estimate at least three million today. Now, uh, by uh, actually here in this thing, I'm putting this picture might take your breath away because he never imagined in little over a decade, 250 students from the Mir Yeshiva would occupy this. And a legend, legend had it that it had exactly the same number of seats as students. Now, I, and, and these rabbis and students were reputedly studying there for 18 hours a day. Now, can, can I just ask you something? He so, didn't build it for that. He built it and then the Mir Yeshiva moved there, right? Oh, well, sure, sure. The Mir Yeshiva weren't even taught about that time. This was in 1924 or something. It was much earlier, 1927. Thank you. I'm glad you clarified that. It's almost as though he had a vision that they were coming, but they weren't at all. Now I'm going to digress for a moment to tell you about an incident regarding the Mir Yeshiva. Now the Japanese warmly welcomed these uh, uh, refugees from Lithuania to Kobe. One day they summoned four Jewish leaders, among them was Jerry Shatkus's grandfather, and they asked, why do our German allies hate you? They must have a good reason. Now, gosh, they were in a sticky position, but Rabbi Kalmanovitz came to the rescue and very wisely replied, they hate us because we, like you, are not Aryan, not blue-eyed and blonde. In Germany, you would not be allowed to marry a German. Well, there was a sea change in the attitude of the Japanese. Now, by a really strange and happy coincidence, I met the only Baghdadi girl to marry a Mir Yeshiva boy. Um, now, you have to know that I actually met her in an elevator in Miami, the Shabbos lift, and and she happened to be there and we got chatting. So it's, it's really strange, but wonderful. And that's Muzel Cohen and Lazar Endless. There's some Mir Yeshiva boys. Oh, this is a very precious picture. When I showed this in Shanghai, there was somebody in the audience who recognized one of the boys. I mean, it's a very precious uh, photograph. And that, that's so with her sisters. And, oh, no, 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 this I'm getting wrong. Let's leave it there. And see, Hartoon had no, the Hartoons had no, no children of their own, but they, okay, uh, let's go there. They had no children of their own, but they adopted six girls and five uh, various, uh, uh, five girls 
of various nationalities, not Chinese. Lisa herself adopted 10 Chinese children. And he, he brought them up as Jews. They went to synagogue and he employed a Jewish teacher. And that's the, that's the family, the Jewish teacher was a mohair and actually provided a Rolls Royce to transport him to, to and from his home. And uh, now, Leo actually is only very recently passed away. Uh, and actually they all have now. I, I had kept very close contact with him. And uh, now Maple, who's wearing this hat, has actually written a biog her biography in my book uh, about the bizarre household and the skeletons in a family cupboard. Uh, this is my only chance of it being a bestseller. Now, yes, the, no, okay, now, yes. Um, Hartin died when he was 84 years old in 1931, and he died reciting the Shema and wished to be buried in the traditional Jewish manner. But his funeral caused a furore in the community and you would see, see exactly why. Does this look like a Jewish funeral? These pictures get a glimpse of 2000 mourners and it's a mishmash of Taoist, Buddhist, like daddy Jewish officials, each performing their own rites. The cantor eulogized um, uh, Hardun and the boys kowtowed reading. They kowtowed while they were reading Kaddish. It was more Chinese than Jewish in character with hundreds of joysticks surrounding the grave. And some Baghdadis went ballistic when they found out that he had left. That's a mausoleum, very un Jewish. Some Baghdadis went ballistic when they realized that Hardin had left an entire fortune to his wife. And this was a staggering $150,000. Uh, I'm running out of figures trying to calculate how much that's today. From Baghdad to Basra, Jerusalem, Bombay and Shanghai, the wires were kept hot with the claims of obscure relatives. Now in New York, I met the claimant Salah Hartoon, who came to Shanghai when he was 16 years old to contest the will. He vividly remembered the sensational legal battle for Hartoon's estate. It was in the British Supreme Court for China. Now the case hinged around the question of citizenship. If the court decided Hardin was British, his wife would inherit the entire fortune. If he decided he was Iraqi, she was entitled to only one quarter of the estate and the rest was divided among the next of kin. These had some reams and reams of these court cases. I, I enjoyed reading them. Now, now I can imagine there was a howl of outrage when the British judge decided in favor of Lisa and many furiously protested. And they say the British Treasury garnered 500,000 oh. pounds in debt duties from an Iraqian. This was their story, and they were sticking to it. More and more of these. And they now pointing out that Lisa Hardun was a devout Buddhist, you know, she wasn't properly married. You've got to just read this to believe it. Okay, and there we have. Now, Hardun Road was the first paved road in the foreign concession, and several people have roads named after him. But do you know of anyone who has a monopoly set named after him? Okay, now let's see what we can discover about Baghdadis in that fascinating city. Baghmadi merchants diversified their business interests. 
they invested in property, land, public utilities, and influenced finance. They dominated the stock exchange, and I'm quoting here, in the 1930s, when there were no more than 700 Baghdadis in the city, the president and more than one third of the 99 members of the Shanghai Stock Exchange were Baghdadis. And I, they discussed tactics in Judea Arabic, very handy it was. Now, Baghdadis had a high profile in real estate markets. Marcella Rubel, an American um, journalist in the 1925, uh, noted that half the business and residential areas were in the hands of Jews from the Orient. Although they ne never numbered more than 1,000, they made a uh, absolutely considerable contribution to the development of Shanghai. And they constructed some of the, land the landmark buildings you see here. And these fashioned Shanghai to the fifth largest city in the world in 1932. So soon Ezra, Hardoon, Benjamin, and Somek buildings located in the heart of the city to say nothing of their palatial homes. Today are monuments of a once vibrant community, particularly as cemeteries no longer exist. Israel's messenger called Shanghai the Tel Aviv of the Orient, and it had, it had labels like Paris of the East, Paradise of Adventures, and the most wicked city in the world. A clergyman famously said, God owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology if he doesn't destroy Shanghai. Now, some like Ezra Sassoon, Kaduri, Hardun, Shamun, Benjamin, the Josephs, two eggs. I love their names. Anyway, they were fabulously wealthy. So most of the documents and headlines focused on wealthy members of the community who had a high profile. But we must bear in mind that the majority were in fact middle class and many were poor. Now this is David Ezra's family he had a high profile within the foreign Jewish community. When I saw this photo in Cecil's album in Hong Kong, I intended to use it as a book cover, uh, but then it was pointed out to me, it seems nothing whatsoever to do with China. It could be a photo of British gentry in England, couldn't it? You see, they lived in the lap of luxury. Um, the house now, it's now the People's Armed Police have taken it over and a threatening guard prevented me from taking photographs. I'm going to whiz through these. Just bear in mind, this is Shanghai in the 1920s. Swimming pool, tennis courts, electrically operated gym, also ballroom. And it's, they, they, it could, it could accommodate 150 and extravagant fancy dress parties. The furniture was Louis the 15th. And this is Marble Hall, the Katuri residence. The, their home burnt down and Laura, his wife, Laura Mukata, tragically lost her life in the flames. And here we have Ellie Katuri with his son, Lawrence, and Son's other son is Lawrence, and that's Horace. A great deal more about Horace later. <clears throat> this, uh, their home is used as, now as a ch children's, it's called the Children's Palace. It's an arts and craft center where children are, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> they taught arts and craft and ballet dancing, and I, I, it's wonderful to see them in the leotards, which was really wonderful. And here, there's a bond waterfront, and we are going to see. This is the iconic Peace Hotel. It was completed in 1929, and it belonged to Sir Victor Sassoon, who was the grandson of Elias, who founded um, the um, Baghdadi settlement in Shanghai. He 
lived in the penthouse and he held sensational fancy dress parties. They became a legend. Now, that's a victor. Now, he owned Shanghai real estate valued at nearly nine million sterling. That was thanks to his grandfather, Elias. He was renowned in horse trading circles and bred horses. Now, if I tell you that he won the prestigious Brit British Epsom Derby four times, you will understand why he famously said, the only race greater than the Jewish race is the Derby. Now, he loved the company of beautiful women. And when asked why he never married, Sir Victor replied, I promised at least 50 women that I wouldn't, and I can't bring myself to disappoint, disappoint that many. Well, he finally plucked up his courage and wait for it, at the age of 78, he shook the world with surprise when he married a 39-year-old Texan, Maud Evelyn Barnes, on the face, 1st of April, 1959. It was not a coincidence that it was all Fool's Day. Now, he jokingly explained, 77 years of being a bachelor are essential to acquire enough judgment to choose the right wife. And he, and he said, oh, he boasted, I, I understand women very well, because half my ancestors were women after all. Now that's where he lived. It, it was a Tudor villa, and to date, uh, the grounds are used, huge grounds used for a hotel and a zoo. Now, in the words of Israel Cohen, a Zionist visitor to Shanghai in 1920, these buildings and the lifestyle they depict suggest a great deal of energy was spent amassing wealth and in the pursuit of pleasure. <coughs> But to my surprise, I discovered a veritable stronghold of uncompromising Orthodox Judaism. <clears throat> this was because the elders of the community were proud of their Babylonian heritage and determined to preserve their unique identity. <clears throat> you know, excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to dash and get some water. Please excuse me, but it's my throat being affected. <clears throat> And just want to say that Maisie, I put it on the group, but Maisie's speaking till 11.15. If anyone needs to go for any class they've got, um, then, um, you know, then that, that's fine. But she asked to be able to finish her talk. I hope that's okay with everybody. I'm so sorry about that, but I couldn't go on. I'm, we've never done that before. It's rather embarrassing. Please, I'm going to take up my left off. Now, here we see that they were trying to preserve their, uh, their, their identity and the wealthy benefactors Hello. provided institutions to preserve their traditions. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello, someone's not on mute. Um, can you everyone make sure that they mute, please? I'm just looking to see. Okay, we should be all right now. Sorry, carry on, Maisie, please. All right. So here we see uh, one of the, they wanted to preserve the Baghdadi tradition and the infrastructure of the community. And this um, Oher Rachel Synagogue was donated by Sir Jacob Sassoon. And the World Monument Fund is 
has declared this building something that has to be preserved. It has some 30 torus scrolls in its beak. And let me see some of the interior, it was absolutely beautiful. And we know, we recognize this. Um, sadly, this impressive building was demolished in 1985 and replaced by office box because of the valuable site of this building. Now, this is Nisim Ezra. Uh, he was the editor of the Ezra's Messenger, which we've seen some quotes from. And this is, this paper, it was a paper that was, I think I'll go back, no, okay. It was a paper that was devoted to a Jewish interest and also in, all, in, in the Far East and also Zionism. It's, that's his father, that's his mother, I mean, not his mother, his wife, excuse me. And this is the Israel Messenger, which says that it's devoted to the interests of Jews and Judaism, the Far East and Zionism. The Sangha Jewish School began as a Talmud Torah, where the boys learned Hebrew through the medium of Arabic. And blossomed into a full-grown co-educational institution where secular subjects were taught, preparing the children for an overseas Cambridge exam. The Jewish Communal Association was established in 1909, and um, it recorded births, marriages, and also uh, it sought to the provision of kosher food and distribution of charity. Now, this solid infrastructure enabled the community to maintain its identity throughout. And there's a kid to birth of, of I, Isaiah and Flora Cohen. And uh, this extract, a part in Aramaic, it says that it's Shanghai on the banks of the river Wangpu in the Republic of China. I have a feeling that all the kid to I, I might be talking rubbish, but they always seem to be giving a name of a river in case the town disappeared. I don't know, I'm just speculating. And now the Toic wedding, at the, and that's, it was a close, it was a very close knit community and social life centered around their homes. Now religious ceremonies, annual balls, fun fairs, wedding engagement parties kept the community together. And I, I would like to point out that this little boy here, let me see, is Isaac, Rabbi Isaac Abraham, this little one. I don't know how my mouse. Can you see that if I point? And that's his brother, Sasson. Um, that's her grandfather. And here we have, that's another wedding. Um, nice to get pictures of the community together, it's really lovely. And there we have the Caliph Jazz Band, which was organized by Ezekiel Abraham. Um, now, I want you just to <laughs> stop and my, compare it to a band in Baghdad, and um, where they played popular Western songs at parties and communal events, and the youth were up to date with all the latest dance steps. I don't know if any of you knew Moses and Hilda Cohen. Um, Naomi, you might have, they were in the synagogue when I was there, and this is their wedding reception. Now this is David Ezekiel Joshua Abraham with his wife, Marcel, he was a respected president of the community and his home was a nucleus, its nucleus. Large gardens, notably the Kaduris and school picnics, sports days, brought the community together. By all accounts, the tract of land behind the Abraham's home was a venue for Sabbath afternoon football. Now it was Jacob, 
but it was only for Sabbath, but they did actually play then as well. This is the Jacobs versus the rest, it used to be. And this, they were a very large family and fielded a formidable football team. They only lost when it rained because they all wore spectacles. And that's the family. And this is, they seem to have removed them for this photo. Isn't it difficult to distinguish the, the, uh, them from the British gentry? And they were the most devoutly observant uh, of the, uh, in the community, really. Now compare this family in Baghdad. Here's a typical middle-class family, at least, and yet three generations of Salah Jacobs family. Now, uh, Joe Jacobs became a um, diplomat in Israel and was a journalist and a radio broadcaster, one of the most interesting people I ever interviewed. It was really fantastic to talk to him. And here we see that Baghdadis were extremely fond of gambling, particularly card games, mahjong, and they never lost their passion for Taudi, which is backgammon, on which they were nurtured. As a community, they identified with the British. British interests were their interests, and many were British subjects. Uh, because they were born in Bombay or had resided under the British Raj or worked in British firms. Now, a British passport well, was a passport to privilege and much sought after. The Baghdadis were intensely, uh, the wealthy Baghdadis were, actually all of them were very patriotic and the wealthy emulated British gentry. They joined European clubs and they were prominent in the race, race court, which was the hallmark of the British colonial system. We see them riding Chinese boy, boom. <laughs> he gave me the photo, he gave me this, he's the only. And that's Abraham. Here we have, now, these photos make it difficult to believe that clubs and sports were not part of Baghdadi culture, but in Shanghai, they developed the British passion for competitive games. Ezra and Togi family had a high profile in the hunt club. They got dashing figures in the elegant riding gear, and it was a family occasion. The family were then full force to support them. Uh, and here, uh, and here we have this uh, boat trips were a favorite leisure activity. As demonstrated in their treatment of Kaifang descendants, Baghdadis felt strong solidarity with other Jews, but believed it was important to preserve Baghdadi identity and emphasize the difference between Sephardim and Ashkenazi. Now in Shanghai, the Baghdadis encountered the first Ashkenazi community comprised of Russian Jews escaping Tsarist persecution, who began arriving in 1895. Now, by the 1930s, their numbers rose to seven to 8,000. Initially, the Baghdadis funded prayer halls and, and but they maintain separate services because of the difference in liturgy. In fact, the entirely different social, economic, political backgrounds caused tensions between the two communities. Now, the Russians were involved in the import export markets, trading mainly in fur, bristle, and wool. They developed their own communal institutions and um, they established the Ohel Moshe, Moshe Synagogue and Rabbi Ashkenazi, here we see, was a Lubavitch rabbi, was employed in 1920s to, to, uh, 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 to be the leader of the community. And he was very much well respected by the Baghdadis. <clears throat> now, the Russians were ardent Zionists and they, they frowned upon marriage um, certainly the, 
they didn't, right up to the 1930s, the Baghdadis frowned upon marriage with the Russians, but in time these barriers crumbled and common meeting grounds were found in the Shanghai Jewish School and the Boy Scouts. And I have a very hard time convincing the younger generation that there were ever barriers between them, a really hard time. They do not believe me, I have to show them documents. But Baghdadi Jews felt an exceptionally strong sense of solidarity to the victims of Nazi persecution, who began trickling into, the, into Shanghai with the rise of Hitler. Now, by the end of 1939, the 10 square miles of Shanghai International Settlement became a city of refuge for some 20,000 refugees from Nazi oppression. Why was this? It was an open port. The documents and visas were not necessary. I think this was the only attraction, most certainly not their first choice. Now, the influx must be seen in context of the Sino-Japanese War, which began in 1937. The Japanese bombed the Chinese city. Thousands of homeless Chinese poured into the foreign concession, swelling its population from one and a half to four million. From the time the Jewish refugees stepped foot in Shanghai, they were maintained solely by Jewish relief organizations uh, that, the, that's Jewish, uh, D.J. Abraham's daughter distributing these gifts. Jewish families responded generously with gifts of fooding, clothe, food, clothing, and furniture. Invitations on a regular basis led to lasting friendships. A majority were white collar workers, professionals, businessmen, skilled artisans, but in the war-torn city, the struggle to earn a living was overwhelming. Refugees were perceived as a threat because of competition for few jobs. So the warm welcome extended to the first arrivals, cooled, cool as their numbers soared. This is a used clothes market, but the impoverished refugees peddled possessions to eat hard to live in. The rent was astronomical and most destitutes were forced to live behind. This is dormitories housing 200 to, 200 to a room. The Hein uh, cafeteria served up to 5,000 hot meals a day. So Victor Magnanus, so Victor Sassoon magnanimously provided accommodation for 2,500 refugees. And this was a time when no accommodation was available in the refugee swollen city. His revolving fund loaned money to set up businesses. In time, from the ruins emerged restaurants, open air cafes, nightclubs, organized concerts, theaters, art exhibitions, pro proliferation of newspapers. You've got to hand it to them. They were really very resilient. Now here, um, you see some of these meal, uh, mere yeshiva boys. Now wealthy Baghdadis were helm of the, uh, at the helm of the relief work. Uh, so Horace Kadoon, uh, I've got this a bit out of sync, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 Horace Kaduri was a driving force behind this, uh, the school, which was known as the Kaduri School. It educated about 1,000 pupils at a high academic standard. I met several former pupils who were successful business and business and, and professionals. Now, Horace organized an 18-day summer camp, and in his words, to give the children an opportunity of a little happiness, plenty of nourishment, and fresh air, and thus build up their health. Though he remained a bachelor, he was a father figure to the youngsters of Shanghai, and a grateful community has planted forest in India. And in 1997, this monument was dedicated to the benefactor of Shanghai Jewry. Baghdadi Jews had an eventful history. Their lives 
their lives were at risk um, during the Sino-Japanese hostilities. And during World War II, they endured tremendous hardship in this war-torn city. In, in July 1942, the German Gestapo chief, Joseph Meisinger, he was known as the butcher, the butcher of war. So he arrived in Shanghai, but the Japanese were not willing to engage in the final solution for their ally. They did, however, set up what they called a designated set area for stateless people, which housed some 17,000 refugees from Nazi persecution. And the Japanese pointed out, the order makes no mention of Jewish refugees and all other foreigners are treated according to nationality. And this is absolutely true. The British subjects were interned in civilian assembly camp centers. Iraqi nationals were not interned, but were required armbands. Their movements were severely restricted and, and with, there were severe food shortages. Their assets were frozen. Assembly became destinate um, and they several became destitute and reduced to selling their possessions. After the communist takeover of Shanghai in 1949, all foreigners were cl classified as foreign entrepreneurs, despised imperialist parasites. Property owners were condemned as exploiting capitalists. The Chinese populace became more vastly anti-foreigner. Baghdadi Jews were pressured to leave Shanghai. Ironically, the Baghdadis had acted host to a huge number of refugees, left Shanghai as refugees in the search of homes in Israel, Hong Kong, Australia, England, U U the USA, and America. I find it impossible not to be moved by the demise of this once vibrant community, but happily I can end on a brighter note. Now there is a, a resurgence of Jews in China, as estimated to be 10,000. And here, this is one of Shanghai's thriving Habat centers. They have, they have, I think, 30, and which incorporates synagogues, schools, a school and a restaurant. The center, typically host about 50 to 100 on Shabbat. Uh, unfortunately, because of the coronavirus, they have barely 10. Well, I just want to thank you for staying the course on this long journey on the Shanghai Express. It's been a great tra a pleasure traveling with such a wonderful companions and Oh yes, you can unbutton your seatbelts now. I would be very pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Maisie, can I say that on behalf of all of us um, here, it's been an absolute joy. Thank you for sharing your passion. And it, that really comes across, you love your subject. We can see that. Yeah. Um, fascinating photos and the, um, the the sort of tidbits of information that you've gathered have really drawn a fascinating picture of this community and I do so hope to be able to visit at some point post corona but thank you so much for sharing all of that with us today. It's um, a it, great pleasure thank you. Do you, do you want to shut your screen down to take the um, um, yeah, yeah, screen yeah. share off? And if anyone has any questions to ask Maisie, thank you. That would be, now would be the time. Maisie, sorry if I'm um, um, going over ground that you covered. But I'm just wondering what happened to those assets um, that remained in China? Did the government seize them? And was there any effort at a later date to get some kind of retribution you back know to the families? I would say nearly all the assets was, were seized. And I know that one of the Hardoon boys stayed back in try, trying to rest. The, the, I, I think it's, um, they said that the father was treated as, as British and the British still had some sort of thing. 
but I don't think they got much money back. I, I would say the Chinese government took it all. How sad. Mm. <laughs> it depends on which point of view you're looking at it. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Daisy, thank you. It was it's such a pleasure listening to you and the way you recount the stories is a really um, very beautiful. It's a lo lovely to hear you. I could hear you for hours. Thank you so thank much. You. I won't take you up on that. Maisie, you've got some lovely messages in the chat. Um, it's so fascinating. Thank you. It was amazing. Breathtakingly fascinating. So interesting. Thank you. We've got some nice chats in the inner side. And uh, yeah, can't wait to read the books. I'm going to go and buy your books straight after this. And um, thank you, really, thank you for sharing. It was a fantastic morning. I really enjoyed it. You have no idea how much I've enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate that. <laughs> Rosie, do you want to say something about your, what you're doing next week? Are you on mute? You're on, you're on mute, Rosie. Um, 